Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Yes, the moustache is gone. It has been replaced with some cuts that I sustained during the live stream that we did the other day. So thanks to everyone that joined that. It was certainly a lot of fun. Today though, we're gonna be talking about a range of news coming straight out of Intel's Architecture Day 2021, which has detailed the designs and features of several upcoming products, including Old Lake and XE HPG graphics. As this is one of the earliest looks that we get from Intel in the year, we aren't gonna be talking about any specific products, so there's no announcement of the Core i9-12900K today or anything like that. Expect those announcements closer to launch, but we will be getting a better idea of what Intel will be launching in the next couple of quarters. In particular, today we're going to learn more about Alder Lake's performance and efficiency cores, including IPC claims over Rocket Lake. Intel has detailed their Arc graphics, including a new DLSS-like super sampling feature, and we'll learn about some designs and layouts to expect from CPUs and GPUs. I'm gonna start here with the graphics announcements because personally, there's a few super interesting things in here that I want to discuss first. You might've seen the announcement several days ago where Intel announced some key information information on their upcoming discrete gaming GPUs, so let's quickly recap those. Intel has announced that their graphics cards will be branded as Intel Arc. These graphics cards use an architecture from the XE HPG family, aka XE High Performance Gaming. The first generation of these architectures is called Alchemist, and graphics cards based on Alchemist will be launching in the first quarter of 2022. Alchemist supports hardware accelerated ray tracing and the full DirectX 12 Ultimate feature set, and Intel are also working on a supporting AI enhanced super sampling technology. One of the first things Intel went into in their graphics section of their Architecture Day presentation was a deeper look at what exactly is their super sampling technology. It's called XE Super Sampling, or XESS for short, and it's Intel's equivalent to NVIDIA's DLSS technology, both in what it's trying to achieve and the fundamental design. The basics of XESS is that it takes a low resolution rendered image straight from the game engine and upscales it using a custom algorithm that includes deep learning technology to produce a final high resolution output frame. Similar to DLSS, and in contrast to AMD's FidelityFX Super Resolution, XESS is a temporal algorithm. So to produce the final image, the algorithm not only uses the current frame, but also past frames jittered to improve the sampling area, and motion vectors. In fact, if you look at this diagram for how Intel have explained XESS, it looks very similar to NVIDIA's diagrams on how DLSS works, suggesting that the two technologies are based on the same concepts. Impressively, XESS does not require the use of dedicated TensorCore hardware, or any specialized hardware at all. In fact, XESS will work across a wide range of hardware on the market, including integrated graphics, and the competition's products. So XESS should work on all of Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA GPUs. Running XESS on other GPUs will utilize DP4A instructions, while on Intel GPUs it will use their own XMX hardware acceleration. This is where Intel gets the benefit from designing XESS. When it runs on their GPUs, the cost to run XESS is lower, leading to higher frame rates. We can see from this chart the sort of differences Intel are expecting. They are showing XESS on their GPUs using XMX as having slightly more overhead than traditional upscaling, but far less overhead than simply rendering a higher resolution native image. Running using DP4A on other GPUs is shown to have about double the overhead of the XMX implementation, but this should still be far superior to native 4K from a performance standpoint. During the presentation, Intel showed visual quality comparisons between a 1080p game upscaled to 4K using XESS and native 4K. And it wasn't just a static image to provide the ideal scenario, there was a small amount of admittedly predictable and slow motion. The image quality of the XESS image looked quite good, and Intel are claiming up to a 2x performance improvement over native 4K rendering. Intel also showed XESS running at 4K compared to the actually rendered 1080p image at a 2x magnification scale, and it's quite clear that the reconstructed XESS image is far superior to the 1080p input. Notably, there weren't many motion artifacts, although of course this is going to be an ideal demonstration. 
The XESS SDK will be available for game developers later this month, with XESS using DP4A instructions set to be available later this year, so there's a possibility that this technology will be first available to run on AMD and Nvidia GPUs before Intel starts shipping the first Arc products. Intel also said that at some point they will open up access to the tools and SDK for everyone while talking about open source standards, so maybe it's going to be open source. What Intel are effectively promising here is a DLSS killer that works like DLSS but is available for all GPU owners. The play here from Intel is pretty simple. They know that DLSS is a strong selling point to Nvidia's GPUs, so they need to nullify this advantage with their own technology to gain any traction in the GPU market. The only way to do this with effectively zero discrete gaming graphics market share is to make sure that their DLSS alternative runs on all hardware, so that game developers have a significant incentive to use it, and in particular, integrate it instead of DLSS or in addition to DLSS due to its wider hardware support. Of course, we'll have to wait and see how the technology ends up from a quality and performance standpoint, and also how many games integrate support. It is a temporal solution that requires game integration into you know, the engine pipelines, so it may be more complex to integrate than something like FSR, but being temporal, it should produce superior image quality. This announcement is a significant step forward for image upscaling techniques that should benefit all gamers. It gets us that little bit closer to a gaming ecosystem where developers have many upscaling techniques to work with that can be used on many different GPUs. It's a blow for NVIDIA and their proprietary closed-off DLSS technology, who are now facing serious competition in reconstruction technique, but with the promise of much wider support. And it's also a bit embarrassing for AMD that Intel, a new player in the discrete GPU market, have been able to beat them to creating an AI-based temporal image reconstruction technology. Alongside XESS, Intel detailed their XEHPG architecture, Alchemist, though we're not getting any SKUs at this stage. One of the big changes to XEHPG is how Intel are naming the building blocks of the GPU. Previously, Intel used execution units, with products like their top-end Tiger Lake mobile parts having 96 execution units. This has been replaced with XE cores, with each core containing 16 vector engines and 16 matrix engines, plus cache and a few other things. Intel described prior XELP designs having a maximum of 6 XE cores, meaning that each new XE core is roughly equivalent to 16 old execution units. The vector engines perform floating point and integer operations, while the matrix engines are designed for accelerating common AI operations and Intel's new XMX instructions, such as seen in XESS optimized for Intel GPUs. The matrix engines appear to be Intel's equivalent to Nvidia's tensor cores, though it should be noted that Intel has designed XESS in such a way that using this hardware is not a requirement, it just accelerates the workload for better performance. The next building block of the XEHPG GPU is the render slice, which contains four XE cores, four ray tracing units, and the remaining hardware such as the geometry and rasterization pipelines plus the required backends. These slices are then combined into a larger overall GPU with shared cache in between, with a maximum of eight slices in this Alchemist design. This is where the rumors of Intel's high-stand XEHPG GPU having 512 execution units come into play. What Intel have disclosed here is a maximum of 8 slices, each with 4 XE cores, for a total of 32 cores. Each core is equivalent to 16 execution units, and boom, we have that 512 execution unit number, though Intel are of course going to be using the new terminology moving forward. Compared to XELP and their discrete Iris Max product, aka DG1, XEHPG is able to push the frequency 1.5 times higher at a given voltage and has improved performance per watt by 1.5 times as well. This should see XEHPG's clock speed exceed 2 GHz, though this is a very rough calculation based on this early data. As for process technology, Alchemist and XEHPG are built using TSMC's N6 process node. You're probably familiar with TSMC's 7 nanometer node family, which are the nodes used across many AMD products, including Zen 3 CPU dies and their RDNA2 graphics. N6 is effectively part of that family, building on N7 through the addition of EUV layers and increased transistor density. In the future, we will be seeing further improvements to the XEHPG architecture with architectures codenamed Battlemage, Celestial, and Druid, which refer to XE2HPG, XE3HPG, and XE Next. Again, 
No information on specific SKUs at this point. We're still probably six months or more from launch with Intel talking about a Q1 2022 launch for Alchemist Designs. I mean, we didn't even get any information really on the memory architecture and subsystem for this sort of design. So that is still to be announced as well. However, we do know we'll be seeing 32XE core designs, improved efficiency, higher clock speeds than prior Intel designs, and support for matrix instructions and accelerated ray tracing. So lots of interesting stuff to get excited about. The other major announcements out of the Architecture Day 2021 surround Alder Lake, Intel's upcoming CPU design. Intel has detailed several aspects to Alder Lake, including the efficiency cores, performance cores, hybrid layout, and more. So let's dive in. I'll start here with the performance cores, codenamed Golden Cove. These are the cores designed for the fastest speeds and high performance workloads. The next iteration on Cypress Cove, seen in Rocket Lake, and Willow Cove, seen in Tiger Lake. A lot of Intel's disclosures in this event were very low-level stuff, for example, the sizes of the micro-op queues, decoders, cache, and so on. I'm not going to dive into all of those little details. If you're interested in a full breakdown, then I'd recommend reading the analysis from our friends over at Anantec, who I'm sure will have something quite comprehensive. But the basics for the performance cores are this. We're looking at a significant overhaul to all areas of the CPU core design. Basically, everything is bigger, wider, deeper, there's more cache, and so on. Better predictors are also a significant part of this design. Stuff has been added everywhere. What I'm sure a lot of people are wondering though is how do all of these design changes affect performance? Intel are disclosing a 19% average IPC improvement for the Alder Lake performance cores versus Cypress Cove in Rocket Lake at a fixed 3.3 gigahertz. Perhaps the most interesting takeaway here is the comparison as Intel are specifically looking at Cypress Cove rather than Willow Cove. Cypress Cove is closer in design to Sunny Cove in Ice Lake than their newer Willow Cove core in Tiger Lake, which never made the transition across to the desktop. So while this comparison is relevant for desktop CPUs, where we'll be moving from Rocket Lake to Old Lake, it's unclear how this new architecture compares to Tiger Lake in terms of high-performance core IPC. Of course, these IPC comparisons have also been made in productivity-based workloads like Specint, PCMark, and Geekbench, rather than in gaming. There were no gaming-related performance charts in this presentation, so that will remain a mystery until closer to launch. The efficient cores, codenamed Grace Mont, are also an important part of the Alder Lake architecture. Once again, a lot of the disclosures here are low-level stuff, which we won't go into detail on, but a lot of the design principles are similar to the performance cores in that Intel has tried to make the CPU as wide and deep as possible, but this time while conserving die space. The efficient cores are a lot smaller than the performance cores, so not every feature of the big core is transitioned down, but Intel is still promising a lot of throughput for modern workloads. One of the key improvements here, especially compared to Intel's previous efficient cores in the Atom line, is that more modern instruction sets are supported. Specifically, AVX is now supported, unlike prior Atom designs, which is key as many of today's workloads use AVX. This means that when the scheduler is trying to allocate a multi-threaded AVX workload across the performance and efficient cores, or if it's you know trying to move a workload from performance cores to efficient cores to save on battery power, it doesn't have to worry about the roadblock of the efficient cores not supporting the relevant instruction set. Not every instruction supported on the performance cores is supported on Gracemont, such as AVX512, but key instructions are available. Another key point here is that while hyperthreading is included with the performance cores, it's not included with the efficient cores. So if you have eight performance cores, you'll have 16 threads, but with eight efficient cores, there will be just eight threads. As for performance, Intel are claiming one efficient core slash thread is roughly equivalent to one Skylake thread in latency performance, but with 40% lower power consumption. In fact, this chart shows peak efficient core latency performance as higher than Skylake. Intel are also claiming 40% greater latency performance than Skylake at a given power level. Then for throughput performance, these gains improve. When comparing four efficient cores to a two-core four-thread Skylake design, so same thread count, Intel is showing 80% more performance. Though this isn't a power equivalent figure, basically it looks like the design goals here for the efficient core were to make something similar to their Skylake architecture from 2015 in terms of performance, just in a way that is far more efficient. Then they paired those with the high performance cores in Alder Lake, which we'll talk about next. So the overall Alder Lake architecture is being split into three different designs. We've got desktop, mobile, and ultra mobile. Each design uses a different portion of Intel's building blocks and core layouts. The desktop design features up to eight performance cores, eight efficient cores, and has a 32 execution unit integrated XE GPU. 
Interesting that Intel is still using execution units here, despite changing this terminology for their gaming GPUs. Intel also mentioned that this is an XELP design ported from Tiger Lake, so it doesn't sound like Alder Lake features a substantial upgrade in the integrated graphics department. Notably, the desktop design does not feature integrated Thunderbolt or an IPU. All up, this would give the desktop up to a 16-core, 24-thread configuration. Then for mobile devices, Intel are pairing 6 performance cores with 8 efficient cores for a maximum 12-core, 20-thread configuration. There's also a 96 execution unit XELP GPU, and it's here we see the inclusion of an IPU and Thunderbolt. Meanwhile, for the ultra-mobile class, so this would likely be 9-watt type CPUs, Alder Lake features two performance cores and eight efficient cores, along with a 96 execution unit GPU for a maximum 10 core 12 thread design. In the largest designs, Intel will be including up to 30 megabytes of last level cache, which is shared between all the CPU cores and graphics. You can think of this like an L3 cache that you might have heard about in prior designs. As an example, Rocket Lake has up to 16 megabytes of last level cache in an eight core design, while Tiger Lake has 24 megabytes for eight cores. This 30 meg in Alder Lake will be split among 16 cores, although of course with the 8 plus 8 performance efficient split. It will be interesting to see how that fares in comparison to AMD's Zen 2 design, which features 32 meg per 8 core CPU die for a total of 64 meg in their 16 core parts. With that said, Intel uses much larger L2 caches at 1.25 meg per performance core in line with Willow Cove, and up to 1 megabyte per efficient core, compared to just 512 kilobytes per core with Zen 3. The memory subsystem has been upgraded substantially to support DDR5 technology alongside DDR4. Alder Lake supports DDR5-4800 and LPDDR5-5200, as well as DDR4-3200 and LPDDR4X4266, so motherboard vendors will have to choose which tech to implement. Memory overclocking will of course be supported as well to push higher frequencies than that. Old Lake supports PCI 5.0 as well, with 16 lanes from the CPU along with 4 lanes of PCI 4.0. The PCI 5.0 lanes will provide double the throughput of PCI 4.0. In addition, the chipset will provide 12 lanes of PCI 4.0 and 16 lanes of PCI 3.0, which is a lot of lanes for any additional hardware. Connecting everything inside the Alder Lake CPU is a high bandwidth compute fabric supporting up to 1000 gigabytes per second of throughput. One of the big challenges with designing a hybrid design is how do you schedule tasks across two different types of CPU cores? Intel's solution to this is the Thread Director, which is an intelligent layer built into the hardware that works in conjunction with the OS to schedule tasks appropriately. Basically, this is advanced telemetry on what the CPU is doing, the thread mix, state of the cores, and so on, and provides this to the OS so the OS can make better decisions on where tasks should be allocated. Intel says it is exposing information about the CPU to the OS that it hasn't exposed before, and the guidance that the CPU provides to the OS is dynamic and includes hints, so a lot of the overhead of scheduling is removed from the software side. Naturally, though, this does require some level of OS integration, which is where Windows 11 comes in. Intel worked with Microsoft to integrate Thread Director telemetry into Windows 11 for scheduling decisions. As such, Alder Lake systems will need to be running the latest version of Windows to get the best performance. This is one area that will be very interesting to investigate as the performance of Alder Lake hinges on how well this integration between hardware and software functions. The entire CPU will be built on Intel's 7 process node, which is a rebranded version of 10 nanometer enhanced Superfin. These names are a bit meaningless, as previous naming would suggest Alder Lake is being built on a similar process node to Tiger Lake. Now it looks like Intel is jumping from 10 nanometer to 7 nanometer. Of course, the reality is something a little bit different. It's really just marketing, though. As for release timeframe, the first Alder Lake CPUs are set to be released in the fall of 2021, with fall apparently being a season for people in North America. Everywhere else in the world, that's referred to as autumn, which means basically the last quarter of the year. So that's pretty much it for Intel's Architecture Day 2021 announcements. Well, at least on the consumer side of things. They did go on to spend roughly an hour talking about server architectures like Sapphire Rapids and some of their upcoming accelerators, but we aren't a server-focused channel, so I'm not going to cover those things at all. Personally, I think this is one of the most exciting architecture disclosures we've had from Intel in some time. The Alder Lake architecture is quite a significant departure from Intel's prior CPU designs, with the inclusion of P-cores and E-cores alongside one another. 
As this was an architecture event, it wasn't heavy on benchmarks or performance claims, but we do have a better idea of what Intel are doing this upcoming generation. We now know their IPC claims for the big cores and performance claims for the little cores, and what additional features are being brought to the table like DDR5 and PCIe 5.0. At least on the CPU side from here, it's all about SKU announcements, with the first chips to launch in the fall of 2021. We don't know which CPUs that refers to, whether it's desktop or mobile, and usually Intel leads with mobile, but at least something is coming at that point. And of course, we know roughly what sort of configurations Intel will be able to offer based on the designs they showed off today. However, there are still a number of lingering questions to be answered. A lot of the discussion at this event was surrounded around productivity tasks and how the design differences are going to improve productivity and AI workloads and all those sorts of things. Not a lot was mentioned about how Alder Lake will handle gaming workloads, which are sensitive to things such as latency and memory performance. The claims of a 19% IPC increase over Rocket Lake is nice for productivity, but in the past, those sorts of numbers haven't translated well to gaming, so we really don't know if Alder Lake will be a superior architecture for gamers, especially with all the complexity introduced with a hybrid design. Another question that remains in the air is clock speeds. Last Architecture Day, Intel spent some time talking about the frequency gains they had achieved with Tiger Lake versus Ice Lake. We didn't get any of that today, so it's unknown whether the new Intel 7 process node will allow this level of IPC at the same or better clocks, or whether there is a regression in that department which will hurt performance. Most exciting of all was perhaps the announcement of Intel's XESS technology, their competitor to DLSS that will work across all GPUs, with special acceleration on Intel hardware. Super keen to check that out in action and see how it works. Intel's Alchemist GPUs are still some time away, probably six months or so at this point, so while we did get a look at the top-level architecture, there's still a lot to play out before Intel are ready to talk about SKUs and performance. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. A lot of discussion on CPUs and GPUs and features and all that sort of thing, lots of low-level discussion that we kind of glossed over in this one, but I think, like I said, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming, and it'll be very interesting to see the actual SKUs that Intel announced for these products, especially Older Lake, which I expect will be coming not too far away if they are targeting that fall 2021 launch window. If you're interested in supporting our coverage, you can consider supporting us through our Patreon or Floatplane pages. Links to those are in the description below. You can also grab some merch there if you're interested, like our new hardware unavailable design. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.